Alright, let's get this straight. You're gonna disagree with my opinions. You just will, that's a fact. Okay? Now, what I've gotten from looking at countless mock drafts is that people think DeAndre Ayton's the consensus first pick. People think the Suns are definitely gonna take him. And I mean, I, I sort of see where they're coming from. Like, you know, he's dominant scorer. He bullied people in college. I don't think he's the first pick. Just say that. Because I think the player who fits the Suns best at this point is Muhammad Bamba. So Bamba has the longest wingspan ever recorded at the draft combine. Um, a full couple inches longer than Rudy Gobert, who is probably defensive player of the year this year. Um, and Bamba has the work ethic, I think, in order to improve his offense, which was the only thing, which was what limited him in college. His defense was great. He blocked 3.6, 3.7, something like that, shots a game in college. Um, and I just think the Suns are looking at a guy here who's got more potential than anyone in the draft, just based on his physical gifts and the fact that he's actually mobile for a big man. Um, and defensive players at this point are just hard to come by. Like, offense is what everyone learns at this point growing up. You're taught how to put the ball in the basket. But Bamba has been taught how, not, how, how to stop people from putting the ball in the basket. And with the Suns roster and the Suns defense, they need someone like that. So at this point, I think the Kings can't be completely sure Luka Doncic is willing to play for them. And if you look at the Kings roster, if you're a top prospect, are you going to play for them? If you have that choice, probably not, no. And Doncic does have that choice. So what the Kings need is they need a scorer at this point. I mean, they, they need anything. But the logical thing for them to add is a scorer. And they already have a bunch of big men taking up minutes. But they're pretty thin on the wing. So what they're going to end up doing here is they're going to draft Michael Porter. So Porter didn't really play that much in college. He played like three games, maybe a little more. Um, people don't really know what he's capable of doing against really good competition. But if he would have played this year, like a year ago, people were projecting him to be like the consensus number one pick. He was the consensus number one pick before he missed pretty much all the year with a back injury. So at this point, Porter can lift the Kings. He's a really good scorer. And if he develops properly, he could be like, you know, 25, 30 point a game guy. Um, first or second team all NBA. And he's just the best fit for the Kings, so that's who they're going to go with. So now we come to the Hawks. And looking at the Hawks roster, we're looking at not a lot of talent, and there was that whole thing with Dennis Schroeder unfollowed them, deleted everything off his Instagram that had to do with them. So there's a pretty solid chance he's getting traded. So I'm thinking, if the Hawks, what the Hawks are looking for is someone who's young, who's got talent, um, who they can lean on as a scorer. Because, especially without Schroeder, but even with him, who do they really have that's a great go-to scorer? Well, at this point, the best guy who's a go-to scorer, I think, is Marvin Bagley. Not only can he create in the post, he can also take his guy off the dribble. He can. He actually shot about 40% from three, taking about two a game. Um, he runs the floor better than Aiden, who's actually still on the who's actually still on the board at this point. He finishes better. Uh, he takes his man off the dribble better, and I just think he's the second best guy in this class mm -hmm. behind Bamba just given his athleticism, and then the rebounding, where we had to pretty much invent the term second jump, just for Marvin Bagley. How many guys are you going to pass on at three who had a term invented for them? I'm just saying. So now we come to the Grizzlies, who I'm still not convinced are willing to completely toss in the towel and rebuild, given the fact that Conley and Gasol are still on their roster. I'm thinking, looking at them, sign one or two more mid-high-level free agents, like some guys like JJ Redick, Marcus Smart, who could be hitting the uh, who are hitting the market this season. 
Uh, you sign some of those guys, and you're like a step away from a playoff team, and that step away is Luka Doncic. He's been killing it in the EuroLeagues. Um, he is, by most accounts, the most NBA-ready prospect at this point because he's been playing and dominating in the second-best basketball league in the world for a couple of years now, which no other top mm -hmm. prospect can say. Um, he provides great playmaking um, and can just free things up for this Memphis team who still seems like they want to grind it out on every possession. And Doncic can help free them from that. So now we come to the Mavericks, who are going to be another team that's going to pass on DeAndre Ayton and send him further down this um, unexpected slide. The Mavericks are going to be more intrigued by Jaron Jackson Jr., who's a much better shot blocker, shoots a lot better, and they're looking at him as kind of, you know, maybe not their go-to scorer now that Dirk's gone, but like another complementary piece to go with Dennis Smith Jr. and this nice young roster they're starting to build. Um, so what they're getting in Jackson is they're getting a, th what's really weird, a 3 and D prospect as a center or power forward, which a couple, like a few years ago would have been completely unheard of, but now is almost exactly what you want in a player, in a big man, is someone who can shoot the three, who's got the athleticism, who can protect the rim. This is what you need in this league. And Jaron Jackson Jr. can learn from Dirk and pick up Dirk's tricks and help take some of the pressure off Dirk as the Mavericks want to give him, like, you know, his best last year in the season, the best thing they can do after Dirk has given them 20 years of amazingness. Alright, so he doesn't really fit great in their roster because the Magic already have a bunch of big men, but the Magic are looking here at an opportunity to, with the sixth pick, draft a guy that people are considering the census top pick. Pretty much everyone, most mock drafts I look at, other than the one I'm making right now, are having Aiton at the top, going to the Suns. I just really don't see it. But he's still a top prospect who the Magic are finding at six. And how many top guys are you going to find at six? You're not going to pass on Aiton for, like, Trey Young. So what Aiton's going to do is he's going to get them scoring and rebounding, and if he works hard, he could be really good. I have questions about how hard he's going to work, how good he's going to be. He's got to go harder on defense. He's got to sh start shooting better. But the mad he's still going to be pretty good just because of sheer size. Is going to let him score probably 15 and... 8 to 10 rebounds a game his uh, rookie year. Um, so if the Magic draft him, though, they're going to have to, you know, trade away some of their big men to free up some space. And really, the Magic just need to blow up this current roster. It's, I don't know what they're doing. So at this point, unless the Bulls are completely unhappy with Chris Dunn's work ethic, as they said they might be, um, their biggest need is a rim protector, and the best one left at this point is Wendell Carter. Uh, Carter is a, you know, stellar shot blocker, um, about two a game at Duke. Uh, he can step outside to hit threes, he can score in the post. The big thing is that he doesn't actually need the ball in his hands. He makes the winning plays without needing the ball. If, if you give him the ball and tell him to score, he'll score. He'll go in the low post. He'll back someone down, and he'll find a way to score. He'll open up things when they they'll call in the double team. He might make a great pass. He'll put in a shot. But he's always going to make the winning plays. So even if he's not, you know, the explosive top talent that maybe the Bulls were looking for this year when they traded away Jimmy Butler, uh, he's still going to be a really good reward, a really solid player. Could maybe be an all-star in kind of the, like, bottom tier the way Al Horford was this year, which is actually the comparison that everyone loves to make for Carter. But he could be really good for the Bulls. Maybe not great. Maybe not, like, Hall of Fame, first-team All-NBA, but maybe, like, all-star, or maybe, like, a step below all-star. All 
Okay, I told you at the beginning this is not realistic since so it's supposed to be realistic. But, I think the Cavs are going to go through this offseason like they're going to keep LeBron. I don't know why they're going to do that, because LeBron's gone. Um, but they're going to go through it as if they're keeping it. And if LeBron was going to stay, DiVincenzo is actually a really good option for them. Uh, he plays the point guard, which LeBron really needed in the playoffs, because, you know, he was wasting his energy having to bring the ball up himself. But DiVincenzo could bring it up for him, set up the plays, and let LeBron, you know, catch him a little bit of rest. And when LeBron's playing point guard, DiVincenzo can go slide over the shooting guard. He can also slide there, you know, when JR gets himself stuck on the bench for losing the Cavs the finals. Uh, DiVincenzo pro proved in college he can step up, like, in a limited role to any scenario. He was Final Four MOP off the bench, which was something that pretty much never happened. And most important part for him being LeBron's teammate, he can shoot the lights up. LeBron needs shooters around him. DiVincenzo can shoot. Um, so, I don't think, you know, if LeBron's gone, I don't think this is who the Cavs should draft. But if they have any reason to think LeBron's still going to be here for next year, maybe opts into his player option to explore a better market next year, then DiVincenzo or his like, former college team would be able to some the right choices to draft. Stop, boy. Stop. Oh! So I really think at this point, the Knicks have an in, they, they have an intriguing roster, and I think they're only a couple of young stars, a couple of years away from, you know, contention for a championship. So this, this coming year, the 2019 season, Porzingis is going to be out most of the year. There's no reason for them to try to win, because even if they could by some miracle make the playoffs, they wouldn't go deep without Porzingis. So a year of tanking gives them all this time to try new things, and the thing I think that they really need to try is the backcourt of Trey Young and Frank Nielakina. I think that's a really good relationship because Trey Young has been criticized for not being able to play defense. You know, he's a small guy. And then Nielakina has been criticized because he can't really score. And what ends up happening in this dual backcourt is that they're both going to make up for each other's weaknesses. You put Nielakina on the better offensive player on defense and you can hide Trey Young. Um, so they both make up for their weaknesses. They've both got so much potential if they, like, Neil Aquina has this, you know, 6'5", 7'1", wingspan, a lot of length. Trey Young was the most, ele one of the most electrifying players in college basketball, even if, you know, he kind of slowed down when people discovered he was good. But Trey Young, no matter what, he's going to be a fairly, like, he's going to be a good shooter. Um, I think he could be. Um, a really good scorer, take some of that scoring burden off Porzingis' shoulders, and um, if the Knicks tank this year, they can get like R.J. Barrett, Cam Reddish next year, give the Knicks one more perimeter scorer, and then give them a couple years of adding role players, they'll be amazing. So, the Sixers are already contenders. They established that this year. They walked through the Miami Heat. If they'd actually been prepared, they probably could have gone six, seven games with the Celtics. Um, but I still think there's, there's a really good chance that J.J. Reddick's leaving them this offseason. And he's been huge for them in the process. You know, he's legendary shooter. You can't leave him alone, so he opens things up for everyone else. But if he leaves, that's going to set them way back. So, and even if he stays, you know, he's getting pretty old. He's going to have to start, you know, playing less. So Lonnie Walker, um, he's explosive. He's young. He could score off the ball for the Sixers. Um, they'd love him coming off the bench behind Redick, but he could, you know, start if they have to, if J.J. Redick leaves and, you know, catch passes from Ben Simmons and only have to score on occasion while he learns how to score in the NBA. So I think at this point, the Hornets just have to blow up their roster. Um, they've been, like, a step below the playoffs for way too long, and if they keep around their current roster, that's going to, you know, they're going to continue to be just a step below. But they're never going to be able to add enough pieces to become actual championship contenders without blowing up this whole roster. Um, so what they're going to do is 
this whole massive rebuild which starts with trading Kemba. And so once you don't have Kemba, Kemba doesn't really have a backup, so you've got to draft a point guard. So Shai Gilgis Alexander um, provides them with a young point guard who's got great size. His draft stock was skyrocketing, and he, skyrocketing at the end of the year um, and can just experiment with full reign of the offense next year while the Hornets go for the top pick. So I'm just going to toss both the LA picks in together, and I don't even really know which order these guys are going to be drafted in. But they're going to draft the two unrelated bridges. Um, the Clippers, at this point, I think, are going to try to contend with their current roster, which they can still do. And the way to do that is by playing bridges 48 minutes a game. Mikel uh, gives them a really solid 3 and D player who scores when they need him to and can thrive off the ball as a catch-and-shoot good defender when they don't need him to score. Miles uh, gives them a really good athletic player who had who was a really good scorer in college and hopefully can be another go-to scorer for a team who's really needing one, whose best go-to scorer comes off the bench. All right, well, if you're still here, thank you. So let's go ahead and go out with a bang. I know Grace Allen has, you know, people are talking about him as if, you know, he's late first round, maybe even early second round. Um, but I think that the Nuggets might go and take, have him draft, dra draft him way before people think he could be, or they could trade down for him. But what he gives the Nuggets is a really good hustle player. He's a much better shooter than I feel like a lot of people understand. Um, he'll happily play on the ball when he needs to or off the ball to let Nikola, Nikola Jokic work his magic. He can work as a starter, he can work off the bench, He's and pretty much no matter what situation you put him in, he's a streaky shooter, and so there are nights when he can just go for 30-40 a game, randomly, like without any indication this was going to happen. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. Um, if you're still here, which I'm pretty sure you're not, uh, go ahead and like the video and subscribe, and I'll try to make this next one a little better. Thank you.